Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again for, uh, for coming. Um, I'm really excited to tell you about uh, some of the work that we've been doing with Mission Bio um, for simultaneous single cell mutational and immunophenotypic profiling. These are just my disclosures. Um, Catherine gave a really great intro to acute myeloid leukemia, um, but this is a molecularly diverse malignancy that arises from the aberrant uh, expansion of hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. Um, typically, the five-year survival rate is around 25%. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, um, there are some intensive chemotherapies as well as transplant um, options for uh, a majority of patients, but you know, ultimately these patients do relapse. Um, there have been some new approvals uh, for agents in the past two years, um, specifically targeted agents. Um, and you know, I think one of the things that we're looking to do as a lab um, that's focused on uh, translational research for AML um, is how we can really understand the, what is going on in a patient in terms of the clonal architecture of the disease and how we can use that information uh, to uh, develop new therapies that are going to be effective. So AML is thought to occur from a stepwise process of uh, mutational acquisition. Um, this has been really informed by large uh, bulk sequencing studies done on patients. Um, the thought is that initial mutations happen in epigenetic modifying uh, proteins such as TET2 and DMNT3A. These really expand the pool of progenitor and stem cells in a patient. Um, and this is further confirmed by the presence of these mutations in otherwise healthy adults. Uh, this is known as clonal hematopoiesis. These mutations by themselves do not cause overt disease, but when combined with later mutations, such as RAS and FLT3ITDs, uh, these do progress to AML. Um, these bulk sequencing studies really inferred order of mutation based on the variant allele frequency. So the thought is that if a DMNT3A mutation has a 50% VAF, um, that mutation probably happened first because it's in every single cell. Um, but you know, one thing that uh, we have noticed from a lot of these studies and that you know, more, it's becoming more and more prevalent is that these, uh, a lot of these VAFs often overlap, not, not only within the individual patient, um, but across the cohort of patients. And so it can be really difficult um, to, one, figure out the true order of mutation within a patient, um, but also to elucidate the clonal architecture uh, that's occurring if a patient has more than uh, two or three mutations. So one thing that um, I was tasked with uh, in Ross Levine's lab uh, was to really try and figure out a way to investigate clonal architecture uh, and mutational order uh, using patient samples. Um, and really, again, just to kind of give us a really good framework of what's going on in these patients, um, to look at cooperating mutations as well as mutational exclusivity that has been inferred from the bulk sequencing studies. Um, and working with Mission Bio, um, we've integrated the single cell immunophenotyping with the current uh, DNA sequencing platform that I'm going to tell you about now. Um, we worked with Mission Bio to develop a custom platform. Uh, this platform uh, has 109 amplicons and covers 31 genes that are commonly mutated in hematologic malignancies, so not only AML, um, but also MPN and MDS. Um, what, one thing that uh, separates our custom panel from some of the uh, commercially available ones is that we tiled both uh, the entire gene of DMNT3A and TET2. Um, these, two mutation, or these two proteins are highly uh, mutated in AML, um, and, but those mutations can occur really anywhere across the gene body, and so we really wanted to make sure that we were capturing as many of these mutations as we, as we could. So to date, we've sequenced over 120 um, AML samples, um, and just to kind of give you a, a snapshot of what we've, what we've learned. Um, first is that the majority of AML patients have one to two dominant clones. This one um, obviously being a, you know, a very extreme case um, where there's literally only one clone that we picked up uh, in a high you know, number of cells. Um, this is, you know, we've seen this kind of across all the cohorts of patients, and I'll kind of summarize those cohorts later, but you know, it's, it's always interesting to us to see, um, to see this because this is, the, this is the clone that we want to target, right? This is the clone that we want to disappear in these patients. Um, so really knowing that there is really only one to two dominant clones in the vast majority of 
of patients is really helpful from a, um, a therapeutic standpoint. Secondly, um, when we looked at patients that had more than two epigenetic modifying mutations, these mutations not only occurred in the same cell the majority of the time, but they were also in the same dominant clone. Um, this is really interesting to us because a lot of these mutations are thought um, to not need to occur together because they end up you know, doing similar things to the epigenome. Um, but what we're finding is that not only do, can they occur in the same cell, um, but they actually cooperate and synergize to really push um, clonal dominance. Um, so this sample, for instance, it has three different DMNT3A or uh, IDH2 mutations. Um, the other thing that really uh, has been prevalent from using Mission Bio to look at patient sequencing, uh, patient samples, uh, is that we are able, because of this clonal architecture, to track mutation order. Um, we can identify uh, clones that were antecedent, like the uh, sample that, or like the clone that did not have a KRAS mutation, or that we can tell that this DMNT3A mutation occurred later because there is an antecedent clone um, present that we're able to pull out uh, using this single cell data. So this really allows us, um, we can do this with serial samples too, um, but this allows us to use one sample um, and really be able to say, you know, we think this mutation happened first, second, third. Uh, and forth. Uh, other things that we found from our single, uh, single cell DNA sequencing cohort is a lot of the biological studies hold true. So RAS mutations are mutually exclusive. Um, the, uh, you know, this patient, uh, for instance, has three different RAS mutations. Um, and you know, again, this is another interesting thing that there is a lot of convergent evolution um, that's occurring within a pa single patient. Um, this is three different RAS mutations. Uh, picked up by the same IDH MPN1 double mutant clone. Um, so uh, being able to see this is, uh, you know, on a single cell level is, is really, uh, really interesting. The same holds true for FLT3 ITD and TKDs. Um, this patient has multiple FLT3 ITDs um, as well as a TKD mutation. Uh, and these mutations, similar to what uh, has been assumed, um, are not occurring in the same cell. And lastly, when we uh, separate out um, samples uh, based on their cohort, so we did sequence some samples that were uh, clonal hematopoiesis samples, uh, patients that had just transformed from an MPN to an AML, um, patients that had more than two epigenetic modifying mutations, and then patients that had RAS or FLT3 mutations. What we see is that clonal diversity actually increases as the disease progresses. This is something I think we all assumed, but um, the fact that we're able to really capture that with the single cell DNA sequencing platform um, shows the power of, of what this platform can really do. So to layer on top of this, we started working with Mission Bio um, to add the amino uh, phenotyping uh, and protein sequencing uh, to our current platform. So uh, we used a six antibody panel, um, which included some stem and progenitor marks, um, as well as CD3 and CD11B to mark um, some, some other lineages uh, in the hematopoietic system. Um, how this uh, gets integrated into the current DNA sequencing platform, um, it's a simple antibody staining protocol that occurs prior to the cells being loaded onto the tapestry, um, and then once uh, the um, libraries are prepared, it ends up being two libraries instead of one. So the, it doesn't really disrupt the, um, the actual DNA sequencing workflow. Um, it's, a simple, it's a pretty simple add-on um, in terms of uh, the uh, total workflow. So uh, we worked really closely, uh, again, doing a pilot experiment. Uh, we did six samples, uh, patient samples. Um, and we worked really closely with the bioinformatics team at Mission Bio. Um, so the DNA processing is very similar to the current DNA, uh, DNA processing platform that Mission Bio has. Um, the protein uh, library gets processed and then uh, calculates uh, CLR counts. These are used to normalize not only across a sample, um, but then can, we can also uh, normalize this across multiple samples so that we can merge the data and really start to look for patterns and trends that are occurring across samples. So just to show you um, some TISNY plots from uh, individual samples. So these are looking across all six um, antibodies um, within three samples. You can start to see the linear range uh, that, or the dynamic range that occurs 
um, from the protein expression. There are certain cases where uh, protein expression is really high, like this uh, CD3 population um, up here in the 0097. Um, but you can also see uh, that there are some samples that have you know, very low uh, expression uh, completely you know, across, across all cells. Um, in specifically to point out, we uh, sent them uh, one sample that we knew um, had an MPN1 mutation, and if there are any hem uh, hematologists in the field or in the audience, um, you know that MPN1 uh, leads to a lower expression of CD34. Um, this sample in particular, 7469, uh, is MPN1 mutant. Almost all the cells are MPN1 mutant. So this really confirms that um, the uh, protein expression data that we were getting uh, does actually uh, correlate with um, the genotype. Zooming in on this one sample, uh, we had a sample that had a really high CD3 um, protein expression uh, with two kind of uh, other clusters that were really low in expression. When we layered on top the uh, genotyping data, uh, it was really cool to see that the, uh, the reason that this was separating you know, based on immunophenotype was actually because of the genotype. Um, these cells were all wild type cells um, for the most part. Uh, while the mutated cells were actually very low in CD3, um, but were higher uh, in expression for CD38 and CD34, which um, are more stem cell markers and uh, blast markers. Uh, we could also merge all of this data together and look at, um, see if the sample segregated by genotype. Uh, we didn't have a lot of overlap in terms of the mutations that occurred uh, across these six samples, so um, it would be expected that they would cluster. Um, as, you know, uh, by sample. Um, but the amino phenotype was interesting because we do kind of get this um, not clustered <laughs> version, of, uh, version of the Tisney plot, um, showing that there is some overlap in terms of the expression um, that isn't really segregating out by, um, by the amino phenotype and by sample. Uh, when we look across these samples and look at um, a heat map, I, I pointed out the CD34 an MPN1 correlation in the sample, but we also can start to see some correlation between uh, genotype and immunophenotype. Uh, for instance, in this sample, um, if a cell had a DMNT3A mutation but not an IDH2, um, that uh, cell seemed to be lower in expression for CD34, um, but upon the inclusion of an IDH2 mutation within the DMNT3A mutated cell, the expression uh, for CD34 goes up, as well as CD38, again, um, hinting at this more uh, progenitor um, enrichment. Um, and then the other thing that we wanted to really look at is going back to the clonal architecture um, story and really trying to see if the amino phenotype uh, correlated at all with not only the genotype, but with the actual uh, clones that we found in these patients. Um, and here, again, you can see that the wild type cells really do segregate out um, by the CD uh, CD3 expression as well as the low CD34 expression. Um, and we're starting to do this with more samples to really see if there's any um, individual clonotypes that separate out um, based on immunophenotype and possibly differentiation states. So just to combine all this together, um, you know, one thing that, that Catherine did point out uh, was that the amino phenotyping does, isn't really a binary, um, uh, binary marker. It's not an on or an off um, like a mutation is. Uh, we are getting kind of a spread or enrichment. Um, so this is looking at the clonotype now um, on the Tisney plot. Um, so you can see the wild type segregates out uh, very nicely. But one thing that we really do find interesting is that all of these clonotypes are kind of clustering together. There isn't really any um, huge shift in uh, the uh, immunophenotype or protein expression based on uh, pure genotype alone. Um, what we do see is enrichment uh, for certain markers. So for instance, this double uh, heterozygous mutation in both DMNT3A and IDH2 um, have an enrichment for CD45RA. Uh, and that you know, is kind of uh, characterized here. But there are, there are also cells that are, that are uh, low expressing for CD30, CD45RA. So I think um, we're still trying to figure out what some, a lot of the trends are going to look like from this. We did, this was a small 
a pilot study. We are uh, in the process of sequencing um, a significant uh, larger number of samples with this. Um, and so what we hope is that we can kind of really start to identify trends of either enrichment uh, for immunophenotypes um, or differentiation states based on genotype, um, but also you know, really try to identify if there's specific clones that, that uh, lead to an immunophenotype that can be tracked um, and hopefully targeted at one point. So a quick summary, um, you know, our large AML clinical cohort uh, for single cell sequencing has revealed clear clonal dominance in AML samples, uh, as well as cooperativity between epigenetic uh, mutations. Um, the single cell immunophenotype uh, capability confirms previously determined clinical trends like the CD34 MPN1 uh, connection, um, but we think that this DNA and protein sequencing is really going to allow us to identify changes in immunophenotype based on clone identity um, and the discovery of certain expression patterns in AML. Um, future directions, we're trying now to summarize this large uh, DNA sequencing uh, clinical cohort um, and expanding the DNA and protein sequencing uh, to additional AML samples. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank my lab, um, Ross, who's an awesome mentor, as well as two uh, people in the lab who've been really helping with the bioinformatics. Um, Mission Bio has been really awesome helping us, uh, you know, really go through the DNA and protein data and really learn how to uh, analyze this data. And then the core facilities at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and then my funding. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll take some questions. <laughs>